we're going to get them on the drop. That's what I thought. Well, the cold months are here, it's well into November and, well, quite frankly, this time of year I always put the carp rods away and I love to target chub and barbel. Um, they're two of my favourite species, although I say that for everything. If I'm targeting tench, roach, perch, whatever, they're always my favourite species. I love them all, but um, this is actually my first trip. I've done two days filming here on the River Trent, not at Collingham, not where we are now, um, but I've done two days filming on the Trent in total, but that was enough to make me realise that actually look you've really got to get into this carbaline sort of scene and the volume of big fish that's coming out along the entire stretch of most of the stretches on on the trent um, these days it's, it's difficult to ignore so um it's going to be my new winter venue it's 180 miles just here so 360 if my maths are right round trip um but yeah i mean i did my first night last night for myself i had three fish i had a bream did a bit of a species hunt i had a bream I had a 614 chub, which is a big chub from any river, even though I've been fishing the River Lee for nearly a decade. So, and that's done some of the biggest chub in the country ever, but 614 is still an absolute monster. Great fish as well. Um, and a seven pound barbel. So I sort of know my tactics are right, but today we've, we're on a bit of a social. We've got two nights up here on the weir. Um, I'm in peg three, which I've been told is not a daytime zone, but they do drop down here at night. Um, and I hope, I've also been told actually that some guy had five bites out of here and they were all over 12 pound last week. So uh, yeah, I'm just basically rechucking the feeders every 25 minutes, something like that, just to build up a little bit of scent through the water, very little food, uh, food maximum scent because it's, you know, it's pretty cold that water. And hopefully tonight um, I'll get a chunk. When I found out that I was coming up here to the Trent, it's not too far away from Tracker HQ. Um, so I got in touch with the boys um, because quite frankly, the distance between Sheffield and Canvey is, is significant. So we don't get to see each other all that much. Um, and Gazza came up with the idea that he could pop along, stick it out on social media. So basically the punters can ask me 10 questions um, and he's come up with the best. So here they are. Who got me into fishing at what age? Well, I, I know the age, I was about 10 years old. Um, and actually it wasn't anyone in particular that got me into fishing. I'll tell you the story, it's a bit of a round, random one really, because in the garage at my parents' house, my dad had a tackle box, a seat box, um, a rod holdall, but in the seat box was a massive, great like Rambo bowing knife. And as a 10 year old kid, nine year old kid, whatever I was, that's all I wanted to get out. I got home from school, I climbed up on the side, I got the Rambo knife out, started running around the garden, playing in the trees and all that stuff and sort of fake hunting stuff and like being well hard and painting my face and all that. Um, and I did that a couple of days on the bounce and actually my dad got home early one day and I hurriedly got this knife back into the seat box. And he went into the garage and he went, who's been playing around my fishing gear? And I went, me. And it was basically because it was the lesser of two evils. I desperately didn't want him to know that I'd found this knife and that I was playing around with that because that was definitely a hiding. Um, and anyway, so he said, oh, do you like fishing? I was like, yeah, sort of thing. Like, I didn't really know anything about it at that particular time. Um, anyway, so that Christmas, he gave me the fishing gear. <laughs> I was like, oh, thanks, Dad. I wanted a BMX or something. And um, anyway, I got grounded in January or something. And I went and got the fishing gear out, set the brolly up, set the seat box up, set the rods up and just like fake fished in the garden because that's all I was allowed to do. And I sat there and the, it started to rain and the pitter patter on the brolly sent me into a totally different world. It was like Narnia, it was, it, was, it was spectacular. It was a transformation. And from that moment on, I thought I've got to try and do this for proper. And it was really weird because when I went down our local lake, which is 800 yards away on a holiday camp from the house. So it weren't far, got on the mountain bike and whatever and um, got down there. I had no clue. No one taught me how to fish. I couldn't read at that particular time well enough to learn how to do it. And I was trying to cast and backwind to get the line out and it was a total disaster. But on my second trip, I caught a skimmer about four ounces. Still got the picture. I had this big old horrible puma jacket on, gray and blue or whatever it was. And, um, and it, at the time it was the best fish in the world. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to unhook it. I had no clue what I was doing, but that was the start of my angling life and I've never looked back ever since. Oh, the biggest buzz, an Olympics or a big one. Um, it's a no-brainer to be fair. 
and this might come at, at, to a surprise to some of you, but um, it's a fish. 100% all day long, not even close, because when I go to the Olympics, I've spent seven, eight, nine months of the year preparing for that one competition. I'm a professional athlete, so when I get there, mate, I'm ready, Do you know, like 100,000 people in the crowd, the world record holder to my left, the, the world champion to my right, none of that phased me. I was ready to do damage. But when a 14 pound barbell pops up out of the blue, when you think you probably, you might be in with a chance, but you don't know when it's gonna happen, or a 40 pound carp or a seven or eight pound chub, mate, there's no preparing for that. I am an absolute nervous wreck when there's a big one at my feet. And, and I've got no apologies for that. That's what I do it for. Oh, the hardest fight. Well, the hardest fighting fish, in fairness, is a no-brainer. It's the Mekong catfish. I've had, I've had them to 190 pounds, and the longest it's taken me is an hour and five minutes. However, I witnessed my brother, who is a big old lump. He's, you know, he's, he's in the RAF. He's six foot two. He's 15 stone. He took two hours, 20 minutes on the biggest Mekong I've ever seen. It was estimated at 220 to 240, but, I mean, it looked a lot bigger than that to me. And I'll be honest, as much as he's not a proper experienced angler I wouldn't have done anything different to him and he got absolutely owned for over two hours at one point he said to me he said uh, Dino that's it I'm going to give the rod away or cut the line I was like don't you dare it's a fish I said beat it it's just a fish and, uh, and he's like okay only if you promise me it's going to last no more than 20 minutes and it was under his rod tip literally right there six pound test curve rod bent double 30 pound line at full maximum strength and I'm like mate it's definitely going to be over in 20 minutes and it just went tick 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 and done 200 yards like no problem whatsoever and it was an hour odd later um, so that was the hardest bite in freshwater fish I've experienced not the biggest ones I've caught you know the arapaima are much bigger uh, in size but they're more wily when you actually um, the hook them but the one fish that owned me and I've you know again no apologies for this was a 150 or 160 pound skate last autumn um, and I was up in Scotland on a boat and I hooked into this fish and it was obviously a big barn door right from the start. 50 pound class rods, massive great like shark multipliers and uh, God knows what braid it is, like 300 pound braid or whatever. And, um, and the skipper instantly ran over and started trying to strap, I thought he was trying to grope me to be fair, but he tried to strap me into this big reel right from the start, almost like shark fishing so you don't have to touch the, uh, the rod. And I said to him, I went, look, don't do that. Until I, until I need it, because I want to feel how powerful they are for myself. And he said, you'll need it soon. I said, yeah, that's fine. I'll ask for it when I need it. Mate, 15 minutes later, I was buckled over the side going, give me that brace, give me that harness. And it's because it didn't sort of swim out away from me, I couldn't get my body weight behind it. And my, my back and my arms just gave way. I got it off the floor once and it went straight back down. And they don't look like fish that can sort of turn a, an amount of speed in a short space of time, but boy, can they move. And I, I 100%, that rod would have come out my hands if I didn't have that harness on. So yeah, they are proper difficult fish to land. The most memorable moment on a trip, apart from the fish. Oh, that's really tricky. Um, I don't know, I suppose, and this, this isn't a plug, um, but uh, look, it, it, there's obviously going to be a fish involved, all right? So I'm going to go down the fishy route, but I didn't catch it. Um, it would have to be the 100 and, I can't remember how big it was, 120, 130 pound surabim, uh, not surabim, lao lao catfish, um, piriba, I think they're called, yeah, um, that we had on the grand finale of the fish off that Paul Smith Jr., who was on my team, caught because um, uh, leading up to that, we had three days after these fish. I mean, this river, I mean, this river's big. You know, it's, what is it, 80, 90 yards wide. This thing was three, 400 yards wide, 50, 60 foot deep, 10 out, we're bouncing 10 ounce grippers around. You know what I mean? So it was like, so, so powerful. Uh, and they can be anywhere from, literally from the estuary where it goes out into the sea to 150 miles upstream, you know? And we spent five hours on the boat going up to these, these sort of marks that generally deeper holes that hold the fish. Um, and I got stabbed in the foot by one of them. We snapped a rod, we lost one in a snag, and then on the very last day, when there was thunder and lightning all around us, the cameraman and the sound man were going, look, we need to wind this up because we can feel it vibrating through our gear. The rod goes off, I give it to Paul, and it tows us a mile down the river, and it was absolute, I was near to tears, and I didn't even, you know, I didn't catch that fish. Um, and when it's for TV, 
it's, it doesn't mean it's better for you, but the element of like relief is, is unbelievable. But with what we went through and to catch it at the very, very last moment, I mean, we lost that challenge if you didn't see that, uh, uh, that show, but quite frankly, it didn't matter because it was a fish of a lifetime. And Paul is, I mean, he's a double hard boxer. Um, challenge for the world title, super middleweight world title two or three times. And we were both like proper choked up on the way back to camp that night. And it was, it was magic. There was literally a camera boat with the sound man, two or three cameramen in and a medic. And then there was a boat with my, our guide, Winnell, legend, uh, Paul and me. And we were all going back to camp like that. Oh, looking at each other, just like, just, it was unbelievable. Everyone just had so much electricity and emotion going through their body. And there was only one man on the rod. So that's probably the most memorable thing that I've gone through when I haven't caught a fish. Ooh, who would be my ideal partner to beat Hamidi on the fish off? Um, I don't know, I, do you know what? I'd probably have to pick someone that he's actually had on his team because him and Foggy went at it like, <laughs> <laughs> they loved each other at the start and hated each other at the end. So I think, I don't know, I think he'd be quite a good partner for me because he'd proper get under, uh, under Ali's skin. But um, if I had to pick any professional angler, then it'd have to be either Steve Ringer, because that guy is mustard everywhere I've took him and everywhere I've seen him fish. Probably the best technical angler I've ever seen. Um, or Dovey, because Dovey just, quite frankly, always has one over on Ali anyway, doesn't he? <laughs> Right, now let's face it, any record fish slips into my net, I'm not gonna turn my nose up. So, um, and as I've said before, all the species that I'm fishing for at that particular time tend to be my favorite, but I've been lucky enough after seven years of trying to catch an, uh, an eight pound chub. And when I laid it on the mat, I was totally choked. It looked ridiculous in size. It was a beautiful fish in fairness. It was long, wide and deep. So it weren't like an outsized, looked a bit chunky. It was just massive in every way. And to think that the record is a pound bigger than that, and the difference between a seven and an eight was massive, um, I think I'd have to choose the chub because I just absolutely love them. When I was a kid, I could never catch them because they're always too wily, too spooky. Um, and I've spent the vast majority of my winters in the last 10 years honing my skills to try and make, make the best of the opportunities that I've had. And, uh, yeah, and I've, I've been lucky enough to catch some absolute monsters, but, but one that's over nine pound would be, well, it, look, if I nearly cried for an eight pounder, I'd have a heart attack with nine. The weirdest bait that I've actually caught a fish on. Um, that's a tough one, and actually it's gonna be a, pretty boring answer because when I go fishing I tend to not mess around I go straight in with my A game um, so <laughs> I, I tend to not steer too far from what I know is going to actually do the business I mean I don't think I've ever put anything random on like a slice of pizza or oh got it got it it's just literally come to me right now pasta so um, fishing all stars that went out this year um, I was over on, oh, where was I, Willinghurst, and we was just doing a little bit of sort of smash em up fishing for the first part of the show, and I was, uh, you're not allowed to float a fish or, or fish surface baits on there, so I was just, I was just gonna literally try and find a lump of bread from a sandwich out of the cruise bag or my bag or whatever, and just literally pinch it, dip it, so it slowly sunk, because in the corner, there was a load of fish just sitting up, like, they were sort of mouthing the bottom, but I knew they'd follow it down. Anyway, I couldn't find any bread, so I went and got my chicken, uh, chicken and tuna pasta meal or something and sucked all of the, um, um, shouldn't have done that, should I? <laughs> sucked all of the, um, like the juices off and stuff and um, nicked it onto a little size 10 mixer and flicked it out. Now, I know it's not like a strawberry or like a whatever, a conker, but it's definitely the weirdest bit. I, I caught a fish on a chicken and pasta meal. athletics or fishing that is a tough choice because between the two of them they've kept me out of some proper sticky situations I'm sure um, as a hobby it's 
fishing all day long. I, I picked up a fishing rod way before I picked up a pair of spikes. As a job, athletics. There's the satisfaction of just hurling yourself around that track or into a sandpit or over a bar or smashing a javelin or, a, or you know, turning upside down while you're running at 20 mile an hour and flinging yourself five meters in the air. That's pretty cool, especially if you do it like I did in the pole vault and you don't really know where you're going to land from one jump to the next. But I would say, I get asked this question an awful lot and the fact of the matter is, everyone says, oh, a big fish or an Olympic record. And, and this is a very good way of answering it. There's four of us on this river at the moment in this weir, and we've all got two rods each. Right? Any one of these rods could go over with a 16 pounder, just whether your name's on it. That isn't enough when you're stepping out onto the track in the World and Olympic Games. Your name just can't be on it. You've got to have something inside. You've got to be able to put the time in. You've got to have the talent and the mental fortitude to just push yourself through every single hurdle. So when it comes to like actual achievements, the athletics wins all day long. When it comes to out and out where I just want to be, it's fishing. My favourite river rig and hook size. Well, quite frankly, mate, I mean, I've been fishing for, let's, let's say barbel, because this is what I'm fishing for here. And, and I've had a lot of good chub, um, including last night's 614 on this sort of rig. Um, it's, I'm going to plug, obviously, um, but it's a Guru Micro Leg Clip. And if I want to fish it running, all I do is I get some pliers and I literally squeeze the, like, the circle part, the actual eye of the swivel down, so it's not round, so it doesn't click in. It's oval, so it literally just slides. There's my running rig. It's so simple. I've messed around with all these little bits and bobs and beads here and beads there. And quite frankly, it just you know, probably works as well, but it's just too much fiddling around in the dark. Um, 10 pound IQ2. Um, or 10 pound pulse, it's entirely up to you. They're very, very similar products. They're great fluorocarbons. Um, a reasonably long hook link um, if you're targeting the barbel. If you want to target the chub, 18 inches, the barbel generally sort of three foot, um, and a size 10 NWGB. Never open one out. They've served me well on small rivers where I've literally just been hit and hold in and I've had like <laughs> a pound and three quarter infinity literally buckled in my hand. The hook's never gone. Um, or whether you're on here and you're, you're throwing seven ounce feeders to the far side. That's my go-to on 90% of the rivers that I fish for barbel. Do you know, I, I actually don't have a burning desire to catch this fish or that fish. I've only ever actually set two targets, well three targets, that's a lie. I, I set a target at the beginning of this year and, and you know, caught the fish, luckily enough. But I, at one point in my life, I thought it'd be absolutely amazing to catch a si giant Siamese carp. And then when I caught a 50 pounder, I thought 100 pounder would look proper. And now I've had quite a few 100 pounders. That was one of the targets that I set myself from a really young age, in fairness. Um, but it was unrealistic until, let's face it, Gillam's Fishing Resort came along. Um, the other target was uh, an eight pound chub. It took me seven years, done that. And then the other target that I've ever set myself was a, a, a pretty unknown fish, not unknown to the people that sort of know it. was a very small knit community on, on a little secret lake out in France, very, very snaggy. Um, but it's a fish that had gone over 70 pound and only really seen the bank a few times. And I caught that 64 this year. They're the only three times I've ever had a burning desire to catch a specific fish. I just love being on the bank. I love the chance that one of those rods, either this evening or tonight, is going to buckle over with a 14 pound barbel or a seven pound chub. I love the unknown. I don't like the fact that, don't get me wrong, technology's brilliant and it's going to help a lot of people catch it. And I, you know, I've got a deeper in my bag and I do use it, but sometimes I actually like not knowing. And that's the part about fishing that, that I love the most, the not knowing part. I also quite like my own company. I think I'm quite a nice guy. Some might not, but hey. Dan Banner, you got a weird warped mind. <laughs> um, I don't know, to be fair, I, I remember when I was a kid, I tried to feed my sister, who's 16 months younger than me, um, a polo mint when she was sitting on the po. Um, and I also tried to feed her a bit of Lego then, but I've never tried to get it in my own mouth. Um, I guess there's only one way to find out, really, isn't there? 
I've got to say, I've got a root canal jobby going on at the moment, so I'm not entirely sure I want to try this. I've got to say, this is probably an all-time low in my angling life. <laughs> but if I catch a 14-pounder tonight, I'll be back up to the highs. So. And i also say, I remember these 2x4s being a damn sight smaller than these. So oh, my money's on five, two, going in with the double one. Two. I feel like a fruit pastel man already. <laughs> That's four. Do you know CPR? In case I swallow one. <laughs> Don't do this at home, kids. Oops. That's a way better. Bye. <laughs> Sharp. Mm. <laughs> Are we sticking at 13? Oh, uh. <laughs> yeah, I was close to swallowing one then. 13 though, mate. Oh, I really feel like I've achieved something now. <laughs> there we go. 13. Who was it? What was, what was his name? Dan. Dan. <laughs> I'll have your son.